Welcome to our virtual women's conference. My name is Yvonne Malin and I'm the State Relief Society President. We're happy to have you here today. We'd like to start out by having Hymn 129 and Sister Jody Hill will be playing that piece. After her, we will have a, an opening prayer by Sister Morgan Munson. She's a new counselor in the Young Women, uh, Young Single Adult Ward. Our dear kind Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this day and we're grateful for this opportunity that we have to gather together as a stake. And we are so grateful for the preparation that has gone into the speakers and for their willingness to speak with us today. And we are so grateful for all that Thou has blessed us with and for Thy love for each of us. And please help us that we'll be able to fill up Thy love and of the Spirit as we listen and we are so grateful for all that thou has blessed us with and we say these things in the name of thy son jesus christ amen amen good evening welcome to what i believe is the first ever virtual women's conference for the sisters of the nashville stake my name is yvonne malin and i serve as the stake relief society president we are so happy to be here tonight and we are thrilled that you tuned in for this special program we are very grateful to the many who have made this conference a reality. We thank the speakers, those performing musical numbers, and the specialists that have coordinated all of the technology. Sisters, we have missed seeing you, worshiping with many of you, rubbing shoulders and sharing warm hugs. We know it has been a trying time. The Lord is aware of each of you. Please know of our love for you and from your stake leaders. You have been and continue to be in our prayers. I wanted to make one announcement. President Nelson will share a message on November 20th, that is this Friday, from 12 to 12.15 Central Time, about finding hope and healing in Christ. I thank you for your efforts to reach out to those to whom you minister. I bear my testimony that the Lord will expand each of our efforts, no matter how small, Please pray for the sisters to whom you minister by name or for another person you have been inspired to touch. There are also endless opportunities to serve in the community through the Just Serve app. We can and do make a difference. There are chances out in the community as well as in the comfort of your own homes. I'd like to close with uh, President um, the prophet Joseph Smith's mother, Lucy Mack Smith. She once said, we must cherish one another, watch over one another, comfort one another, and gain instruction that we may all sit down in heaven together. Next, I'd like to introduce Sister Lindsay Tusher. She is the second counselor in the Stake uh, Relief Society Presidency, and she's going to introduce our theme for this evening. In 1874, the hymn, Master the Tempest is Raging, was written by Mary Ann Baker. It focuses on the story of Jesus and his disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee. As you'll recall, a ferocious storm arose. It was so severe that the passengers aboard all feared for their lives. As they looked for the Savior to rescue them, they found him asleep. The Savior awoke, rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. The Savior then asked, Why are ye fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? 
With this story as the backdrop, allow me to share with you the circumstances in Mary's life before she penned this song. Mary Ann Baker was left an orphan when her parents died of tuberculosis. She and her sister and brother lived together in Chicago. When her brother was stricken with the same disease that had killed their parents, the two sisters gathered together the little money they had and sent him to Florida to recover. But within a few weeks, he died, and the sisters did not have sufficient money to travel to Florida for his funeral, nor to bring his body back to Chicago. The Baker family had been raised as faithful Christians, but Mary's trust in a living God broke under the strain of her brother's death and her own diminished circumstances. God does not care for me or mine, said Mary Ann. This particular manifestation of what they call divine providence is unworthy of a God of love. I have always tried to believe on Christ and give the master a consecrated life, she said, but this is more than I can bear. What have I done to deserve this? What have I left undone that God should wreak, wreak his vengeance upon me in this way? But as the days and weeks went by, the God of life and love began to calm the winds and the waves of what this sweet young woman called her unsanctified heart. Her faith not only returned, but it flourished. And like Job of old, she learned things, things too wonderful to have known before her despair. On the Sea of Galilee, the stirring of the, of the disciples' faith was ultimately more important than the stilling of the sea, and so it was with Marianne. Later is something of a personal testimonial and caring very much for the faith of others who would be tried by personal despair, she wrote the words to, Master, the tempest is raging. Master, the tempest is raging. The billows are tossing high. The sky is o'ershadowed with blackness. No shelter or help is nigh. Carest thou not that we perish? How canst thou lie asleep? When each moment so madly is threatening, a grave in the angry deep. Master with anguish of spirit, I bow in my grief today. The depths of my sad heart are troubled. O oh, awaken and save, I pray. Torrents of sin and of anguish sweep o'er my sinking soul, and I perish, I perish, dear master. O oh, hasten and take control. Master, the terror is over. The elements sweetly rest. Earth's sun in the calm lake is mirrored, and heavens within my breast. Linger, O blessed Redeemer, leave me alone no more, and with joy I shall make the blessed harbor and rest on the blissful shore. The winds and the waves shall obey thy will. Peace, be still. Whether the wrath of a storm-tossed sea, or demons, or men, or whatever it be, no waters can swallow the ship where lies, the master of ocean and earth and skies. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace, be still. Peace, be still. We too live in times when the tempests are swirling all around us. Each of us in our own personal way calls out, Master, carest thou not that I perish? President Russell M. Nelson has given us this counsel. Our Father knows that when we are surrounded by uncertainty and fear, what will help us the most is to hear his son. President M. Russell Ballard gave this insight on how he hears the Savior. Receiving revelation only comes, at least in my case, when I have those still and quiet moments. I have found I cannot connect with heaven in a mass of clutter. Our theme for this conference is peace be still. In the messages that will be given today, you will hear about sp spiritual wellness, temporal organization, and emotional resilience. We pray that these messages will stir your faith and help you create moments of stillness in your life and enable you to more clearly hear the voice of the Savior. I testify that Jesus is the Christ. He has all power. He can and will calm the storms in our life as we put our faith and our trust in the Savior and wait upon him. And if, as we do, we will see that the greatest miracle is not the calming of the storm around us, but the calming of the storm within our souls. I testify of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Next, we are pleased to have Sister Kathy Redfern with us tonight. Following her remarks, Sister Rebecca Hall will share with us. After that, we will have a, a, a musical vocal number by Sister Angela Davis. She is the new Relief Society president for the Crockett Ward. Um, she will be accompanied by Sister Jody Hill, and their song is entitled, His Eye is on the Sparrow. Good evening, sisters. My name is Kathy Redfern, and um, I'm so happy to be here tonight. I've uh, been very, very prayerful about this opportunity and grateful to be here. I know that these are 
um, difficult times just in our lives without this COVID experience. So we add that to it, and it certainly has been an interesting year. But as they say, um, we don't grow unless we have to go through some difficult things, and certainly we've had an opportunity to grow this year. Just to give you a little background, I'm again Kathy Redfern. I'm married to Harry Redfern III, who we call Skip. And we have four children, three sons and a daughter, and 10 grandchildren, five grandsons and five granddaughters. And um, we've been in the Nashville area for about four years. Um, I am by profession, uh, a profession that I started very late in my life, uh, am a home organizer. And um, you know, they say you should do something uh, that you have a passion for, and I've discovered that this is something I truly have a passion for. I'd rather be doing it than not doing it. My epiphany came many years ago when we were on a family vacation in Orange Lake Resort in Florida, and we were staying in a two-bedroom condo that was very nicely appointed. There were two bedrooms, uh, two queen beds in one room, and two uh, and a king bed in the other room, and our small children were in the two queen beds. and had a galley kitchen, a very uh, nice little dining room, and then a step-down living room. Uh, very simple, um, and I, as I experienced the week there, I thought, wow, I could so live like this. Now, I know we have children in sports and things like that, and we have other, have other activities that require things, but that's where my journey in uh, home organizing really began. And so I started a business called Home Harmony, which is, uh, my motto is simplify, which means get rid of, get rid of, get rid of, and get rid of. Um, beautify, beautifying chips, things that we can put around our homes that will um, bring a smile on our face or make us happy. And then the enjoy part. Our homes should be a place where it is a refuge from the world. I truly believe that. And I believe our bedrooms should be a refuge from our homes. Um, sometimes our bedrooms become catch-alls. That's where we throw everything or put everything to get it out of the way. And as I have um, been doing this, I've witnessed uh, so many people. I, um, it, it's really fun because they're so happy when I leave because of the things they've done. They've had to make decisions in doing it. There actually has been a study where they discovered that um, clutter causes uh, distraction and irritability. And so when you think about your home, you think about areas that you have a lot of stuff, um, how does that feel? I recently was on a job where um, a lady had her bath and we went through all her cabinets underneath and we had a throw away, give away, and a um, put away place. And the last area was her uh, top of her, her vanity. And I said to her, I said, Marsha, what if we just took all this stuff off? I said, turn around. So she turned around and I took all the stuff off the top of her cabinet. And when she turned back around and just saw hand soap and lotion there, she literally just breathed differently. Um, we have too many things in our lives to process and sometimes people will think that they're so terrible but we're just overwhelmed with life and it really does take a, a conscious stopping and, and looking at what we have in order to um, get rid of it. Some of the areas that we frequent, frequent are our walk-in closets and I really believe that um, less, the less clothes we have, the more outfits we have. The less we have, the more peace we have in our lives. Another area is the pantry. I believe that we should have an in-house store where we can go to, where it doesn't matter if it's more crowded in there, and we maybe keep a running list of what we have. You know, we find peanut butter on sale or something that we use or, uh, a lot. But our pantries, when we open up that pantry drawer, should just be where we reach in and pull something out simply, and it's not just this cluttered mess. We end up actually spending a lot of money because we don't really see what we have. Um, I'm a big believer in make your bed. I think that uh, a bed is a big piece of furniture and it makes a huge difference when you get up and have that order in your room. I think that um, when we think about um, doing this, one of the best ways to do, for example, on the walk-in closets and the pantries, and this is usually a little unnerving for people, but to take everything out so that we have a clean perspective and we're generally a little bit more careful about what we're going to put back. We're a little more aggressive about not putting back so much stuff because we love the way it feels so simple. And when I say uh, less is more, we, we truly do have more outfits because when our closets are so crowded, we reach in for that which we're familiar with. But if we have less in there, we might say, oh my gosh, that skirt goes with that blouse or those shoes go with it. I had no idea because we don't see them. It's so crowded. When we think about um, the beautifying part, just a few little tips, um, fresh cut flowers. 
next to food, there is nothing that I like better than fresh cut flowers. It's, it's life, and especially if you can put a sprig in your bathrooms. It's just, it's life in there, and it just is so pretty. And I'll give you a little tip. Ostromeria, I think they have them at Trader Joe's for $3.99, and if you don't breathe on them the last few days, they'll last for two weeks. They're, they're incredible, and they're beautiful flowers. They start out a little small, but then they get bigger and bigger and bigger. They expand, and they're just gorgeous, and, and it's a for four dollars eight dollars a month is pretty good candles we don't have a fireplace in our place but we will sometimes say let's put the fireplace on so we'll light several candles to give us atmosphere and that's nice a change of pillowcases you can purchase very inexpensive pillow coverings for like ten dollars uh, for large pillows on amazon or whatever but that that gives you a change i change my bedspread out every six months i have a bedspread for spring and summer and a bedspread for fall and winter that's just a change. Um, generally do that at uh, general conference time in April and, and October. And then the last part of that is to, to enjoy it. When you have things in your home that are organized or manageable, if things get messed up and it's not that much stuff, you it's easier to fix and put, put back together and have it nice. Um, It sure means a lot more when we experience this ourselves as opposed to somebody telling us this. So I'm going to invite you, I won't challenge you, but I'm going to invite you to take something in your house, maybe it's a drawer or a small closet, something that's manageable for you to, to clean out. Take everything out and just put back what you really need. And um, I would be very surprised if when you do this that you don't go and check it five or six times that day. There's something about that. And I think you'll even find that when you go to bed at night, you're going to be thinking about that spot that you that you cleaned out. And of course, we have the, the great example of the temple. When we think about going to the temple and the peace that we feel there, it's clean, it's bright, and it's simple. Things are nice and they're beautiful, but there's not a lot of it. I'll share one experience with you when the... I helped uh, my daughter um, years ago do my granddaughter's bedroom and I don't know that she knows what she really said but it was very prophetic and, and um, amazing but Blakely we cleaned out her room and got rid of a lot of things and organized what she had kept her favorite things and she went to her mom and said mom mom come feel my room because it really had more of a feeling than it did even a visual effect uh, it just feels so good when there's less um, and when our homes are like this, we, it, is, it helps prepare for a place of, of revelation, and that's been another topic that I've been asked to speak on, is the importance of revelation. And we have a prophet today that says and asks us, how do we hear him? And I love that word, we, because it's not the same for everybody. We all hear the Lord differently. And we need to, to remember that. So even in some of these examples that I'm going to give you, some of them may be ways that you've heard them. Maybe they aren't. Maybe you have your own ways. But I love the fact that he's asked us to, to explore how do we hear our Heavenly Father. And I think we have to remember that Heavenly Father wants to talk to us. He wants to speak to us. He wants to give us guidance and he wants to give us direction. And if we ever feel the opposite of that, we can clearly know that that does not come from our Heavenly Father, but from the adversary, who would teach us, as it says in the scriptures, to not pray, not to do things that would keep us from getting that. I love this quote many years ago from Julie Beck, who would then at the time was the General Relief Society president. I'm going to read a few quotes to you. She said, The ability to qualify for, receive, and act on personal revelation is the single most important skill that can be acquired in this life. And I agree with that. Elder Rendlin just recently said, The most crucial thing any of us can learn how to do is to hear our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ speaking to us through the Holy Ghost. I believe that James 1.5 is more important than ever. It reads, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. In the age of COVID-19, we are in a unique situation. There is no rule book for navigating these challenging times. Each of us needs to plead for personal revelation and then act on it. And once we've received that revelation, we will know what to do. I hope that each of us can have per personal revelatory experiences that can teach us how to hear him. Elder Russell M. Ballard, receiving revelation only comes at least in my case when I have those still and small quiet moments. 
I found I cannot connect with heaven in a mass of clutter. You have to find those quiet moments in your life when you can contemplate the things of the Spirit. In my experience, when I am in that mode I, and striving to be still, that's when I get impressions. That's when I get a thought from heaven. Our experiences will often be unique to us and as individuals. So we have to ask ourselves, how do we hear him? And then this last quote from President Nelson as he invites us all to hear him. And then there's a promise at the end that I want to share with you that he expresses to us. He says, to hear and hearken to Christ, Latter-day Saints can go to the scriptures, attend the temple, participate in family history work, better recognize the whisperings of the Holy Ghost, and heed the words of the prophets, seers, and revelators. And this is the part I want you to listen to that I love so much. What will happen is you more intentionally hear, hearken, and heed what the Savior has said and what he is saying now through his prophets. And I love this. I promise, this is a prophet of God, and he says, I promise that you will be blessed with additional power to deal with temptations, struggles, and weaknesses. I promise miracles in your marriage, family relationships, and daily work. And I promise that your capacity to feel joy will increase, even if turbulence increases in your life. I remember many, many years ago as a student at Brigham Young University hearing Ezra Taft Benson talk, and he uh, said to all of us that if we would read the Book of Mormon, I remember listening to him, X amount of time a day and make that a, a personal goal to study from the Book of Mormon every day, that great power would come into our lives. And I clearly remember thinking, now, he's a prophet, he's made this promise, I'm going to take him up on this. And so I did. And I can't say that initially that it was just so wonderful and I loved it, but as I stuck to that and continued on and showed my uh, faithfulness in it and doing it maybe sometimes when I didn't even want to, there came a day when that changed for me. And it is truly one of the greatest blessings in my life. I love the Book of Mormon with all of my heart. So the point I'm trying to make here, when our prophet says, I promise you that you will be blessed with additional power to deal with temptations, struggles, and weaknesses. I promise miracles in your marriage and family relationships and daily work. And I promise that your capacity to feel joy will increase even, in turbul even if turbulence increases in your life. So it would be important for us to seek that revelation. And I think we need to start where we are. We're all different. Some of us are reading a lot. Some of us are reading a little. Some of us are not praying. Some of us are playing, praying a little bit. Just start where you are. I love in the Book of Mormon where we're taught that if you don't have anything, then start with asking for desire. There's some things that I know I need to be doing in my life, and frankly, I just don't even have a desire to do it, but I know I should be doing it. So I've started asking for desire. And it's amazing to me at the end of the day, on those days that I particularly ask for desire, that I have felt that. And the Lord will give it to us. God already knows all the things, but there is something about us communicating that to him. Our thoughts, our desires, and our concerns. It shows our faith in him. It shows that we believe he can help us. And I think there are three characteristics that will help us in our experiencing and receiving revelation. And this is a characteristic that I think is really missing in our society, uh, one of which I have to struggle with, and that's humility. Sometimes I actually have to cry the pride out because I'm not in a very humble place. But there is such a wonderful feeling when we connect with heaven in, a, in humility. So I think that's very important for us to strive for. Remembering. The scriptures tell us awesome. Remember this. Remember that. If we stop and think about or try to remember experiences in our lives where we have felt the Lord speak to us or we did have an experience where the Spirit touched our hearts or gave us peace, I think remembering that and reflecting on that will help us work towards that more. And then the third quality is that of patience. And this is a hard one because we want what we want when we want it. And there's something about trusting in God and believing that his time is best. Sometimes I'll put something out to him and I'll ask for help in it and then I'll start worrying about it later and then I'll say even out loud and not this is not meant in sarcasm but I'll say oh my gosh that's right you're God 
You know everything. You know what is best. I do not. So that puts me at peace because I trust that he really does. And when we stop to think about that, God has our very best interests in mind. So we, we need to trust in that and to be patient. Um, and sharing with you um, some different ways in which we can experience revelation. My daughter recently shared a story with me about a friend of hers, uh, Karen Jones, that lives out in Utah. And Karen was struggling with something that the brethren had uh, put out for us as a church many years ago. And I won't go into what it was, but it was very bothersome to her. To her. And so rather than go off half-cocked or upset, she chose to get on her knees and to express her feelings to Heavenly Father about how she felt about what was said and that it was hard and she didn't agree with it and she just needed some direction on this. I think it's wonderful that she went to that source and as a result, the revelation that she received was, it's okay, be patient, things will work out. That brought her tremendous peace. Okay, so she had a hard time understanding what the brethren were saying, but she was humble and she took it to the Lord and she got an answer that helped her be peaceful. Years later, things were changed as to what was said. And she was grateful that she had, had gone to the Lord in that, brought her great, great peace. I remember uh, years ago, um, our three sons um, have occupied a lot of my prayers. And I remember one day in particular praying in the closet and just pleading over and over and finally just saying, Heavenly Father, I am so sorry that I constantly keep coming back to you about these same things. And then the Lord said to me, and this has been years and years and years of praying for them. He said, Kathy, don't you know that every time you pray, I'm bound to do something. And so as a result of that revelation, I said, okay, if that's the case, I ended up praying about 20 or 30 times that day. And I know that the answers that came to me, that the way that he will work, it might be through a song they hear, a conversation they have, a movie they see, um, a book they read, just a myriad. I can't even begin to tell you all the things that flowed through my mind. They weren't words, they were just thoughts and knowledge that the Lord could work incrementally with them. And um, those boys are in good places. They're striving. They're making wonderful changes in their life. And I know through that experience of reaching out to the Lord, trying to seek some revelation that, that he, he wanted to give me, it was a great source of, of peace to me. And as a result of that, I have a very deep testimony of the power of prayer. I know that prayer works. I know that it works. And the adversary would have us not pray. Don't be dissuaded by that. It works. I remember one time my husband and I were uh, kneeling to pray about a business opportunity. And as we knelt to pray, immediately he spoke the words and he, he immediately said, um, well, we can tell that this is not good and we're not going to pursue it because a stupor of thought came. So we knew that that was not the right thing and that um, we didn't, wouldn't, shouldn't do it. Maybe these will um, have you think about things in your life about how you receive revelation. Maybe they're not anything like how you receive it. But Heavenly Father does want to speak to us, and, and I know that. May I just close with my testimony that I um, know that the gospel is true. I am so grateful for it. I'm grateful for this year of um, struggle. Um, as a result of it, and hopefully making good choices, I have learned some wonderful, valuable things that will help me um, go forward. One of my very favorite scriptures is found in Messiah 24. I love this book of scripture where Alma and the people are in bondage to Amulon, one of King Noah's wicked priests who comes upon, he's put in charge with the Lamanites, he's hooked up with the Lamanites, and he puts um, he's put over Alma and his people and the people are afraid and they're frightened and they're praying and Amulon and the Lamanites are insisting that they stop praying and that they aren't to pray anymore and yet then they prayed out in their hearts and the Lord reminds them that he knows they made a covenant with him and he made a covenant with them 
and that he would um, lighten their loads. He revealed this to them. He said, I will lighten your burdens that you will not even feel them on your backs. And in the next verse, it talks about the, the burdens were made light, that they did not feel them anymore, and that they were able to submit, and I think this word is so amazing, they were able to submit cheerfully. Now, what an interesting word to use in the middle of this great trial for them in, in being in bondage, that they were able to submit cheerfully. And then he reveals to them, on the morrow, you will be able to escape. He's going to create a miracle where the Lamanites are all put to sleep so that they can then escape, and they do. I think the biggest miracle is in the fact that their burdens were made light, that they couldn't feel them, and that they were able to submit cheerfully. And my testimony is that in this day and age, with all that we have going on, that we can feel the joy in this life, and we can be cheerful. That's a blessing that we can get as we humble ourselves and seek out our Heavenly Father and receive revelation and inspiration that is personal and pertinent to us. I'm thankful for a living prophet. I'm thankful for the challenge of him asking us to see how we hear Heavenly Father. And then this latest conference where he reminds us that God prevails. How awesome is that? And we should let God, God prevail in our lives. And I leave this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good evening, sisters. My name is Rebecca Hall. I am from the Harpeth Ward, and I'm excited to be here with you tonight. Um, I've been in the Nashville area for about two years now, and we are here to stay, and we are very excited about it. Before we moved to Nashville, we were in New York for 10 years, uh, in and around New York City with little kids. So while we were there, we took a lot of pictures. And that is why I'm here to talk to you tonight, is about picture taking. Now, gone are the days where we would use our cameras and take the roll to the pharmacy and have it developed and then get it back a few weeks later. Nowadays, we can take a picture whenever we want and we can take lots of pictures. Now, if anyone is like me, if you were to look at your camera roll, you might be a little embarrassed for someone to look through it. I know I was, as I was looking through preparing for this, I saw a picture of a donut that I secretly sent to my husband, hoping he would pick me up on the way home from work. <laughs> I saw recipes, directions, blurry pictures from when my children got my phone. I saw all sorts of crazy things on my camera roll. So if you're like me and your camera roll is a mess, this is for you. So what we're going to talk about today is how do we clean up that camera roll? What do we do once we've cleaned it up? How do we organize it? And then once we have beautifully organized all of these pictures, what do we do with that? So that is the plan for today. So the first thing we're going to talk about is deleting. So when you go through your camera roll, you're going to probably have multiple pictures of the same event. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to get rid of all of those multiple pictures of the same event. Now, as you're going through your pictures, one of the things that I like to ask myself is, what story does this tell? What story does this picture tell about my family, about our trip? And if it doesn't fit our story, delete it, okay? Let's say you find that perfect picture and you edit it and it looks fantastic, but you have six others that kind of look similar to it. Right? You can't decide, well, my one, eye, one kid's closing his eyes in this one, but he's opening his eyes in this one. Which one do I take? Just choose and delete it. I am like the delete squad here. <laughs> so we want you to delete. We want you to purge your camera roll. Now, how often do you do that? Well, that's up to you. Maybe weekly, maybe monthly. I embarrassingly had not done it in quite a while as I was preparing for this. And so I had to spend quite a long time purging my camera roll. If you choose a specific time to do it, whatever works for you, I like a Sunday afternoon. To me, it's a very therapeutic kind of walk down memory lane. Um, choose how often you are going to do it and stick to it. As you're purging and going through, you might notice 
that beyond pictures of your family, you also have things kind of popping up. For me, I noticed that I had a lot of recipes. I had a lot of pictures of my kids' artwork. Um, I had reminders. And I had a lot of screenshots of parenting advice. A lot of those. <laughs> so what I have done is in my um, photo roll, I have created folders so that I can stick that parenting advice for when I'm really struggling and I need that reminder, I know where it is in my phone. So also as you're purging and deleting, notice your habits and organize on your phone. That is one way to get organized in your camera roll. And then lastly, um, I just want to remind you, what story does this tell? I think that's such a key phrase. What story does this tell about my family? And if you're a Marie Kondo fan, does this spark joy, right? We do that with our things. Does this spark joy? Do it with your photos as well. We are just inundated. We have thousands and thousands of photos on our phones, on our computers. What really sparks joy? What, what picture, when you look at it, makes you smile? That's the one that you want to keep. And then delete the rest. Okay, so clean that space out. Okay. You're now a deleting master, everyone in this room and watching. You're a deleting master, what now? Okay, we need to back up our photos. Okay, so we need to organize and back up our photos. So there are a couple ways we can do this. We can do a cloud-based backup, which I recommend. Now, if I'm saying cloud-based and you're hearing that and you're going, I heard about the cloud, but I don't know what it is, that's okay, you're not alone. Um, what I would suggest, actually, I was just talking to my mom the other day, and she is finishing her degree at BYU, and we're so proud of her. And she enlisted one of the very young sisters, just graduated high school, brand new in Relief Society, to come tutor her in technology. So I would say, if there are things that I'm talking about today that technologically-wise don't make sense to you, find one of those young sisters in Relief Society. It's a great way to reach out and to meet those young sisters in Relief Society, and they can help tutor you in some of these um, things that we're talking about today. So cloud-based, you can use the iCloud, Google Photos, Dropbox, and they're connected to your phone, right, virtually, so that you have a backup copy. Another thing that I would suggest is that you do a physical backup copy as well. This is an external hard drive. Um, you plug it into your computer, and you can then save your photos um, on this little, it's basically like a giant USB is basically what it is. So you can save all those photos on an external hard drive as well. And this is great because how many of you have ever had your computer crash or lost your phone, right? And this is why we're doing this is because we need to have multiple with technology. There are bugs and there can be issues that happen. So we want to make sure that all those wonderful memories are back. Now, you're backing it up, you're doing an awesome job, you've got your cloud base, your external hard drive. How do we organize it? This is something that only you can answer. Some people like to organize their photos by theme. Um, I find that that's just a little too um, much time for me. I like to organize them chronologically, which means I, on my um, computer, I have them by year. So everything for 2020 goes in the 2020. And I like to whittle it down to as small amount of photos as possible. Okay, we don't need all those extras. We don't need, um, you know, 20 pictures of the same thing. We just need that one that makes you smile, right? That tells your family story. Okay, so you have everything backed up and you're organized digitally. But no one can see them, right? Unless they have your phone or your computer, no one is seeing these wonderful photos that make you smile and spark joy. So what do we do with all these wonderful photos? Well, we're going to talk about how we display them. All right, so um, I have a few ideas for you and we're gonna go through those really quickly. So we're obviously going to want to print them to display them. So for our wall art, um, I have some different places that you can print that are recommended by photographers. So if you have a photo that you really want a nice print of, okay, you're gonna frame it on your wall. Um, photographers recommend MPICs 
or printique. Now, you say I have the two dollar signs here because it's a little bit more expensive. Um, a good budget um, place to print your photos is Snapfish, okay? Really great quality, a little less, okay? It's more of a budget friendly option, but still really great, great quality. I know the photographer who's taken photos of our family recommends MPix, and I've been super happy with um, the photos that I received from them. Another fun thing that you can do are what are called engineer prints, which is where you take your picture and you make it really, really large. Now, you can spend more money and have it done um, through a company that will do it like on archival paper and it will look beautiful. Or if you were like me and living in New York City as a teacher and your husband was in school and you had 10 years of tight, tight budgets, then you can go down to your Kinko's or any um, copy store where they print uh, anything for engineers. Um, so they have these huge printers for blueprints and things like that. And you can print your photos. So, for example, I was decorating my kid's bedroom. And I had this old photo of my mom when she was a kid. This photo sparks joy for me. This is my mom in a photo. She's just happiness and light. And so I was able to go down to Kinko's and for $10 get this printed. It's just a, a photocopy, right, that's been blown up. Um, now, I could, if I wanted to, um, get a nicer copy of this. You can do that, like I said, and go online. Um, one of the places you can do uh, more expensive engineer prints is called Parabo Press. Um, is a place where you can do engineer prints and they'll print it on really beautiful paper for you. Um, another place that I really like that has kind of more artsy looking printing options is Artifact Uprising. That's a personal favorite of mine. Um, so Parabo Press and Artifact Uprising, they will do specialty prints for you. Now these aren't the only places that do specialty prints. Um, you can Google and find lots of different places that do specialty prints online. And what I would suggest doing is if you're feeling nervous because specialty prints can start to get a little bit pricey, give them a call. Have them look at the file that you're sending them and talk to them about, okay, how big can I make this picture without it looking distorted or those questions that you might have before you pull the trigger. They are so helpful and so kind. So give them a call or chat with them on the computer and they will help you. Um, make sure that it's going to look nice and be exactly what you want. Okay, what if you just want, um, you know, to, uh, a nice photo that you're going to frame? Well, we know that framing can be expensive, right? So I have my favorite budget um, places that I like to get frames up here for you. Um, Michaels, never pay full price at Michaels, mm -hmm. right? There's always a 40% off coupon at Michaels. Michaels has great frames. Target has great frames, Ikea has great frames, and my personal favorite is go to a thrift store, find a not great piece of art, but a great frame, and buy it for the frame, okay? There's some beautiful frames at the thrift store with some not so beautiful art um, that it is framing. So look for the frame, and you can use Rust-Oleum, and you can spray paint it, or you can use Rub and Buff, and um, do some, you know, gold tinting on it. There are a lot of things that you can do with vintage frames that you find um, at thrift stores. And then of course, if you want to spend a little bit more, more money, I find that local print shops, they are so amazing and helpful and they do beautiful work. And of course, you're supporting local businesses, which is always wonderful as well. Um, another thing that we can do is we can do photo books. Okay, um, so this is a photo book service that I have for my family. It's called Chat Books. Um, I have an Instagram for my family. Uh, I, I'm the only one who lives here in Tennessee. So I have a lot of family around the country. And of course, they always want to see pictures of that brand new puppy we just got. Um, I didn't bring a photo of him. I should have brought a photo of my brand new puppy. Um, and so I'm, I post, and what happens is, is, of course, you choose what? the picture that makes you smile to post for grandma and grandpa or whoever it is to see. This company then, at once I hit 60 pictures, which happens about twice a year for me, puts it in a nice little book, prints it with the captions that I wrote underneath, and then I have it um, for my house. 
Now, the reason I love these, I'm not going to lie, the quality of the picture, because they're pulling it off of Instagram, is not the best. My kids love these. They love to grab them. They love to look at them, uh, see themselves, and be reminded of the things that we've done in our family. So I love this. And then also, um, and Chatbooks is not the only one. Um, Parable Press also does uh, a service like that where they'll gather up all of your photos. You can do it straight from your photo roll or you can do it from Instagram. So if you don't have an Instagram, these are still options for you. You can do it straight from your photo roll from your phone. Um, I also get um, my five favorite prints um, sent to me from that book so that I can have a little print as well. Um, and I like these. I like to have, um, I, I would say probably about every year I print off about 15 of these. And I like these because I just have a little wood block with a little strip in it that I can stick and put the picture in and I can change it out. And it makes me really happy. I have a couple on my desk. Um, another thing that I like to do that's very budget friendly is I'll take some washi tape, um, which you can get in all sorts of fun colors and patterns. And I do this sometimes for my kids on their wall if there's a picture that they really love. And you can frame it. You can do a whole frame in washi tape and it's really, really budget friendly. And then they just you know, write off when you're done and you can put a new picture in. Um, so that's something that um, we like to do at our house to use these pictures. And I like them because, um, I, like I said, I can switch them in and out. Um, and then when I'm done with them, I have a really pretty box um, that sits underneath, you know, on the coffee table. And I put those 15 prints and I have about, you know, 100 pictures of a couple of, of three or four years worth of, of family. And because I've whittled it down and deleted and purged and really only chosen those pictures that really make me happy, I'm not, I don't have an overflowing box of pictures. And we can really easily pull that box out and we have these few pictures that make us really happy. I don't know if you growing up had um, the cardboard boxes in the, bo in the closet, right? With, <laughs> with just pictures and pictures and pictures. Um, and no one sees them, right? And they just sit there. And so really I think what, what we're not, I guess purge is maybe the wrong word. We're curating, right? We're curating our picture collection. We're really finding those pictures that bring us happiness and bring us joy and tell our family's story. Um, so I really hope that this was helpful for you um, and that you learned a few things about um, how to get that uh, all those pictures under control and to feel more in control of all the pictures and that you then can you know organize and display them because that's the most impor important part in the end right you want to look back at these pictures they don't do any they don't bring anyone else joy of just sitting on your phone or in your computer so i hope that you've learned a few things and that this was helpful for you thank you so much thank you Because I'm happy
Next, we are pleased to hear Ashley Fleming speak. Uh, following her remarks, our stake president, President David Watson, will speak. Good evening, sisters. What a pleasure it is to be with you as we're in this virtual women's conference. All hail to 2020, right? We're all trying to navigate this crazy world that we, um, that we are in. So by way of introduction, I'll share with you that um, I'm Ashley Fleming. I moved here seven years ago, and when I moved here seven years ago, I was Ashley Smart. So those of you who may be viewing this and are going, wait a minute, she, I thought that was a different Ashley. <laughs> here, here you go, here's, here's all the pieces. So I moved here um, seven years ago. I am a licensed practicing counselor, so I am a professional mental health provider. I currently have a private practice. I have an office in, um, in Nashville and I also have an office in Nolensville. So I was asked this evening to speak to you all just about some mental health um, tips slash techniques and, uh, and I was happy to do it. So I will tell you that we are living in unprecedented times. I'm sure this is no news flash for any of you. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit and I'm not gonna get too sciencey or too heady, but I wanted to give you a little background and wanted to let you all know why you are feeling the way that you feel. So Heavenly Father, and, and I always joke, I especially joke with a lot of my clients, I'm like, when I get to the other side and I get to have a conversation with God, I legitimately have a running list of questions I have for him. So why did you do it like this? I'm just really curious. <laughs> Which is even funnier because my husband will tell you that I am like the biggest questioner. He's like, why do you ask so many questions? Because I'm really curious. <laughs> I'm just really, I'm really, really curious. So I just want to let you all know but as you are just kind of doing a flashback or just, you know, maybe just even kind of an assessment of where you are now that we are in November of 2020 and we're going back to like, you know, March, I'll say when the world just really started to change. 
And maybe you've noticed some things about yourself. Maybe you've noticed that you've maybe felt a little more depressed. Maybe you have some anxiety symptoms that are popping up and you may not have even known that you were an anxious person or that you've ever felt like this before. You could also be, you know, you might be in your head just like, why does everything seem so hard? Or why are things so heavy? Or just, you know, as we're just trying, we're trying to get through this. So let me share with you a little information just about who we are neurobiologically. And when I say neurobiologically, I'm talking about how our brains are wired and AKA how Heavenly Father has created us. So here's the deal. Every single human being here on the earth, every single one of us is wired for connection. It is not God's plan and he did not create us to be beings in isolation. He created us to be able to connect with one another, to communicate, to touch, to um, you know, have, have conversation or even just like, I can think of a time, so when I first moved here, like I said, and I was single, I was living by myself in an apartment down in Franklin, and, you know, I was really busy during the week. You know, I was around people all the time. And so by the time Friday evening got there, you know, got here, I'd be like, oh, it feels so good just to kind of be by myself, to decompress. But by the time about lunchtime on Saturday rolled around, I'm like, I'm kind of lonely. Like, <laughs> you know, what's, what's around? I didn't really have anything. And so I really learned in myself, like the, the or was really powerful for me. Sometimes I would just get out of the house and I would just, I don't know, walk around downtown Franklin or I would go to a park or I would go, you know, just being outside and reminding myself that there are other people. Well, here we are in this, in this day and age and we're living in a shutdown. And, and we are really limited. Now, things have changed a little bit for us here in Tennessee, but for those of you who um, have family members in other areas of the country or friends, um, if you're keeping up you know, on the news, I will get to that in a little bit. You know, we know that this looks different in different areas in different, in different places. And I'll also tell you, like, and, and even as we're like starting to go back to church, it's different, right? First of all, we're, we're all wearing these masks. I'm not wearing one right now, but I will let you know in this room that I am sitting in with all these other people that you can't see, everyone is masked. And I'll tell you what's difficult for me about that. All I can see are their eyeballs. I don't see any of this. And this part of our face is such an integral part of communication. That is legitimately how we get a feel for the energy in the room, we read social cues, we, we are able to determine moods. So think about that. I mean, we we're trying to operate in a world that we, again, neurobiologically are not wired for, okay? Second thing is, is that I in our brains, okay, our brains are also not our, I mean, when I say we're wired for connection, that's really like our nervous system and the energy that we are sensing, but our brains are wired for story. Our brains are wired for the beginning, the middle, and the end. It does not feel good to our brains when any one of those pieces are missing which is why it is a default human condition when we don't have information what do we start doing we start trying to fill it in now there's some danger in there okay <laughs> but i will say far far and wide and, and what i'm just going to share with you today is that we don't have the whole story we are living in a time right now where there are so many what ifs what if what if what if what if? So that is where we definitely have an uptick in anxiety, depressive symptoms. I mean, just, I'm going to say mental and emotional health overall. So now that I've given you a little background, I want to talk to you about how do we help ourselves? And, and, here's, and here's the deal. I, I say that we are all on a spectrum here. We're all on a spectrum. Some of us are really, 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 really struggling. Others of us maybe are not struggling as much, but here's what I know to be true. There's not one person 
that has not been affected by what is going on in our world. So just know that we all have some common humanity here. Every single one of us has been affected by what is going on in our world. So I'm going to give you an acronym to follow. So if you want to, I don't. If you want to take out notes and jot this down, you can. Um, I'm limited to what I could display, so I figured I'm just going to talk to you about this. And, and y'all can just, you know, maybe make a note and, and write it down. So it's an acronym that's called MAPS, okay? M-A-P-S. And the M, and I'm all, you guys, I'm up here and I'm totally drawing a blank right now, but I just remembered it right now, so here we go. <laughs> so this is vulnerable and this is real time. Okay, the M, stands for measurable. Every single day, you want to give yourself something, some task that is measurable. Okay, and I'm not talking grand sweeping, I'm gonna go ahead and repaint my whole house today or something like that, something, something huge and big. You want to break this down. Maybe it's reorganizing your sock drawer. Or maybe it's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend 20 minutes and go through my photo roll and I'm going to organize some photos. Um, you know, something that's small, but something that's measurable. I'll tell you in the beginning, and maybe this may be still where someone is, which is okay, there's zero judgment going on. Maybe it's, I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna take a shower today. I'm gonna do it. <laughs> I'm gonna get that and I'm, and I'm going to get that done. So something measurable. The A stands for activity or active. Our bodies need to move. And I am not talking some crazy power workout that you have got to go and do. It could simply be if you've got a dog, take the dog for a walk. If you, or if you don't, still go for a walk. We are having some lovely, beautiful weather right now in Tennessee. Um, I will tell you just being out and remembering that you are not alone, that you are not isolated, even as you just see other people, you know, milling around, you might cross someone on a, on a walking path or pass someone, you know, on a walking path helps us so much. It helps our brains. It really, it really truly does. So something active because by the way for those of you who might know that you struggle more with anxiety anxiety responds very well to activity it's something that really helps to manage that emotion the p the p stands for pleasurable okay y'all also we have chemicals in our body that um help us to know what we like and what we don't like. Our favorite or the one that makes us feel really good is called dopamine. We call it our feel good, okay? We want to do something that evokes pleasure and sends off some dopamine receptors in our, in our brain and starts feeding that, okay? You know, you might think of watching a funny movie bring levity into your life. There's enough heaviness going on out there. Nobody needs more of that right now. I don't care who you are. <laughs> bring some levity in, into, into your life. Um, sit down, um, you know, play, play a card game or a board game, you know, doing a puzzle, like anything, anything like that, but something that is pleasurable. Have a conversation with somebody. I'm just saying, hey, I'm reaching out. I'm calling to connect or just you know, to say, I was thinking about you. How are you doing through all of this? All, any, any of those things. Okay, and the S stands for silence. We need to give ourselves every single day 10 to 15 minutes of just quiet. We need to do that, or why this is a mental health tip or trick, is because it helps our brains to settle. For those of you out there that are familiar with the game of soccer, and you have maybe you know little kids, in my case, I have nephews that are these 
I'll just brag and say pretty fantastic soccer players, but you know, when they're little and they're learning to play, you know, and the ball's like, you know, kicked waist high and they're trying to kick it waist high and, and they're coached to quote unquote, settle the ball, settle the ball. And what that means is let the ball drop and settle on the ground before you try to kick it around and make a play with it. Okay, in essence, that's what silence does for our brain. So those of you who are probably maybe at this point going, okay, I have little toddlers in my house. Are you crazy? <laughs> like I would love some silence. Let me, let me say this. Kids can do this. And it might not be silence, but you might structure something in your home that's called quiet time. And you can pick a specific time of the day that works for you in your schedule and you do this quiet time. And so it may be they could get out a book, um, they could color, but anything that is you need to let go of the media, get away from phones, get away from TV, all of that, and you just need to give yourself the gift of having your brain settle. Sometimes for me, because um, I am going into my office right now, and so when I'm driving into Nashville, or especially I'll say when I'm driving home, especially, I'll just turn the radio off and I'll have, you know, a solid 30 minutes of quiet time. I can just, you know, it's an easier drive. Um, you know, it's not anything that's stressful to me, but I am able to just, you know, even just that amount of silence. Okay, so maps, measurable, active, pleasure, silence. Along with that, I'm gonna give you a couple other tips. <clears throat> I highly, highly recommend, I'm talking to you like, you like you're all my clients, but I'm just gonna say, I highly, highly recommend for your own mental health, you be incredibly judicious and cautious about how much news you choose to ingest. Okay, be very, very cautious. This goes back to remembering that our brains, we like the story. We like the beginning, the middle, and the end. We are in a world of a 24 hour news cycle and it doesn't take watching it for very long to understand that in order to keep reinventing the same story, they are going, they, they pull out all of the things that we don't know. Well, we don't know this and we don't know this and we don't know this and we don't know this. So no wonder everybody's anxiety is going and, you know, and, and amping up. My recommendation to you, and I'm not saying to stick your head in the sand and not be aware of what is, ha what is happening in our world today. You need to choose one to two resources, and I encourage you to read it. Read the news. And in those, in those resources, pick ones, of course, that are more reputable. Um, anyway. I don't need to go into all that, but just, you know, do some research, maybe talk to someone that knows a little more about this, but pick a couple of reputable sites and use that as, as your information. Now, when we started this in March, all of us thought this was just going to be a sprint, that we would have to do this maybe for a few weeks and that, um, and that okay, then we'd be back to normal and, and our life would be there. And what we're finding is this is very much a marathon. Remember, or, or another piece that I will give you, is that our brains also love novelty. What that means is that we like new, we like different. I mean, think about it when you get a new pair of shoes. I'm just assuming, because this happens with me, I'm like, oh, this is awesome, I love this, <laughs> that everybody does. But it could be anything new or different. We have an opportunity and you, we, to all stretch into different levels of creativity. This is where we get to be creative and we get to construct what it needs to look like for us. We get to be innovative. And as things are evolving and changing, we need to continue to assess and reassess. This is what I call taking inventory. What's working right now? Okay, well, maybe what isn't working? What are some things we could try to tweak and change? My husband and I are in the stage of life where both of our children are grown. They're away at school, okay? So yeah, we don't, again, like in our home, um, we aren't having to juggle 
school trying to teach it online working you know all of all of these things however i can tell you there's been a lot of change in my life as a professional the things that i feel when i'm sitting there you know and have a full day of clients who are trying to manage and, and are going and are going through these things i'm very grateful that things have really grown. I there's not enough therapists for the need out there right now. I can tell you, everybody is stretched. We all have really full loads, and my husband and I continually need to check in with each other. And I have really learned to ask for what I need, and to let my husband know, hey, here's what I'm noticing about me. Here's what's happening, and we're we're really working to be fluid and flexible. And change those things and you know and just reassess and, and and do things differently and so with all of that here's my last bit of advice stay out of comparison stay out of comparison you need to do what works best for you and your family what works for the Smiths or the Joneses down the street may not work for your family and that's okay there is no rule, there are no shoulds and supposed tos. In fact, I really don't like those words at all, but there are no shoulds and supposed tos. You need to develop what works for your family. When we step into comparison and we start looking at differences and noticing that so-and-so looks different than us or we look different than, than so-and-so, that is Satan's favorite tool because what walks in is shame, and there's gonna be some measure of we're not blank enough, good enough, together enough, organized enough, whatever, and we are going to start, we will have those messages if we don't measure up. Don't get stuck in that mire. It is, that will add heaviness to your life. And all of that to say, and why I say this, is I have thought over and over and over in my head of the scripture that we find in 2 Nephi chapter 2, verse 25. Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. I want you to know it is intended for us to have joy. Our external circumstances don't have to determine or make the measure of how much joy we live or what that we have in our life. We can have control over that. I'm not standing up here saying, y'all should be happy that we're all going through this. No, this is, this is really, really hard. It is. I just am hoping to offer you a little perspective here. And I would just like to share with you my testimony that God is so aware of us. I have no doubt. I know that he is leading us through this time. I know that he loves us, and I really believe that there is a purpose to this. I'm so thankful for our prophet and that we have modern day revelation to help guide and direct us through these times that we quote unquote, we don't know. I have a lot of hope in that. And I have a lot of hope in my Savior and bear witness of him. And I say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hello, good sisters of the National Stake. It's good to be with you tonight. I wish I could be with you in person. But I'm in Utah this weekend. And President Maiden is so kind to let me record a message that I could share with you tonight. We are blessed to have a Relief Society presidency in our stake who loves each of you and who prays for you night and day as do I and my two counselors. We love and appreciate you, sisters. One of my favorite scriptures is in 2 Nephi 31.20. It says, Wherefore, ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and the love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the words of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, you shall have eternal life. It seems like a really hard thing to do right now to think about having a perfect brightness of hope, isn't it? Things are tough in the world right now. Things are tough in politics. Um, it's crazy out there. What's happening in our country and 
and in the world about racial tension is scary and and frustrating and um, and makes things difficult. And last but not least, the war we're having with COVID-19. Perhaps some of you already know someone who has died from this deadly virus. Perhaps some of you um, know someone who had the virus and is struggling. My daughter and her family um, tested positive for the virus. Um, they had some mild symptoms, but luckily they're doing better. And I'm grateful for that. I have another friend who has the virus who's not getting better. And we pray for her constantly, hoping that she will recover. This has been a tough year, sisters. However, we will get through it. I know we will. My favorite speaker in all general conferences is Elder Jeffrey Holland. I love to hear him speak. And just when you think he can't get any better, he gives another wonderful talk. About this global pandemic that we're in, he says, and I quote, when the world conquers the pandemic, and we will, may we be equally committed to freeing the world from the virus of hunger, freeing neighborhoods and nations from the virus of poverty. May we hope for schools where students are taught, not terrified that they will be shot, and for the gift of personal dignity for every child of God, unmarred by any form of racial, ethnic, or religious prejudice, end quote. We must have hope, sisters. I promise, as does Elder Holland, the future is bright. Miracles will continue to cover our earth. Our stake will continue to be a blessing to many, and you will make a difference. You, sisters, will make a difference. Your righteous desires will still be met, but we must have hope. How can we have hope? How can we have hope during these difficult times? We can have a perfect brightness of hope as we continue to develop our relationship with our Savior. We must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ. In politics and in business, there's a saying that says, it's not what you know that is as important as who you know. I saw a billboard in front of a church the other day that said, to get into heaven, it is who you know that counts. I testify of that, and I think for us to get into heaven and to experience exaltation, we need to get to know our Savior, Jesus Christ. That will bring us much hope in this difficult time. And how do we get to know him? We need to feast upon the words of Christ every day. I invite all of you to continue your daily study of the Book of Mormon. I hope you're all reading from it every day, just a little bit. It will bless your lives as well as other scriptures that testify of Jesus Christ. I think we need to keep his commandments, sisters. When you make a mistake, and you will, repent. But do your best to keep his commandments. That will improve your relationship with your Savior. We should follow his example by ministering to others. We should love everyone. If I could give a quick plug for justserve.org, please go to justserve.org and sign up for an opportunity to serve. My wife and I signed up on Just Serve to feed 14 men at the Dismas House in Nashville. These 14 men just got out of prison and are transitioning into jobs and halfway houses. It was a very spiritual and fulfilling experience. The men were so kind, humble, and grateful. There are so many good projects on JustServe.org, and I encourage all of us to sign up and to get busy serving our fellow men. I invite all of you to find something on the website that you could be able to do. There are things where you don't have to go out in public, things that you can do behind the scenes. I promise it will be a rewarding experience for you, JustServe.org. We should also be ministering, however, to those to whom we have been assigned. Sisters, we've all been assigned someone to minister to. This is such a help to your Ward Relief Society presidency and to the bishopric. Other ways that we can get to know our Savior Jesus Christ is to follow his living prophet on the earth. I love President Nelson, and I will do everything I can to follow him. As we do that, we show our love to Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father. I think we should partake of the sacrament every week when possible. That will help our relationship with Jesus Christ. And also, let the atonement touch your life. Any part of your life, the atonement will touch. 
That will improve your relationship with him. Lastly, we can be still. Outside of my office door is a painting that has the saying, be still and know that I am God. Create a space in your daily routine, sisters, that will allow you to be still and to feel the spirit. It's hard because we're so busy, but please find a way to be still and listen to God speak to you. Might I also suggest that we all drink of the living water. Behind me in this Relief Society room right now is a beautiful painting by Simon Dewey right here in the Relief Society room in the Stake Center. It's a beautiful painting that depicts the woman of Samaria. I'll read in John 4, starting at verse 7, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. In verse 11 it says, The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? And then I love what the Savior says to this sweet lady. He says to her, Whosoever drinketh of this water, pointing at the well where he was sitting, will thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. A well of water springing up into everlasting life. I think I'm safe to say, sisters, that we all in this room, in this broadcast, want eternal life. We all want to be with our families and our loved ones and our Savior and our heavenly parents. We want to be with them for an eternity. I pray that we will all be able to drink of this living water. I know these things to be true. I know your Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, know each of you individually, and they love you. I know we can have a brightness of hope in our lives, even during these difficult times, especially Sisters, as you get to know your Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as it says in 3 Nephi, let us press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the words of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. And that's my prayer for each of you. We love you. We care for you. We pray for you every day. And can't wait to get back together on a more regular, normal basis. I'm so grateful for you and for all that you do in the Lord's kingdom here in the Nashville State. May he bless you and lift you up. I know these things are true. I know that this is the restored gospel here on the earth and leave you my testimony and my witness in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We'd like to thank all the speakers and the musical numbers this, thus far. It's been a wonderful night and we really appreciate having them here. Next, we will have a closing musical number by Sister Maylee Robbins, How Great Thou Art. Her accompanist is her father, Brother Richard Robbins. Uh, after that, we will have the closing prayer by Sister Jess Brotherson from the uh, YSA ward. She's a new first counselor there. Thank you.
our dear Holy Father, we are so grateful for the um, beautiful opportunity we've had this evening to hear from our fellow sisters and um, the messages that they have uh, felt prompted to share with us and for the personal revelation that we were able to receive and, and guidance um, from Thee. Uh, we are so grateful for the opportunity that we have to gather together um, as sisters in Zion um, virtually at this time and we are so grateful for um, the continual um, peace and support that Thy Gospel brings into our lives. Um, we ask a special blessing upon um, all of our sis the sisters at this time that they may um, be able to receive the revelation that they need for their lives and um, continue to find peace and direction um, in difficult times. And we are so grateful for all that has given us, and we thank thee and say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.